Um, hi everybody, my name is Paul uh, Mackinoff. I currently work for Clinicis um, as the acting blood transfusion uh, domain lead. Today I'm just going to talk about our experience of um, deploying a limbs across a pathology network. So uh, some delivery experts would argue that uh, a good implementation project depends upon planning, uh, stakeholder engagement, harmonization, resourcing and testing. But it's the attention to detail and getting the right people in the right place at the right time uh, that is the key to success. Pathology is working through a period of profound change um, following the well-known report by Lord Corder. And um, these network requirements, um, these networks have many requirements, including strong leadership, new ways of working, and in many cases, new equipment and IT systems. Clinicists, um, we have the developed a deployment model which creates a structure that sets out the stages and stage gates or checkpoints that need to be clear, cleared before uh, your limbs goes live. We know it works because we've seen networks go live over the past two years, despite the huge pressures that have been placed on pathology by the COVID-19 pandemic and the unprecedented demand for health services that has followed. But even so, there are plenty of things that pathology networks, laboratories, BMSs and their IT colleagues can do, can do to make the process run smoothly. So uh, I'm just going to talk through um, a few pieces of advice. Planning. So big projects can be exciting and rewarding, but they can also be very challenging and exhausting. Over time, communication can diminish and progress can stall. The antidote to this is good planning, both at the beginning of the project and also at each stage throughout it. In the initial uh, stages, eagerness to get on, you may be tempted to skip or rush through this part of the project, but take time to plan it very well at the beginning and in each stage. This helps to make sure that everyone is on the same page and that everyone knows ahead of time that it will, what, what it will take to get to the next milestone of the project. Good planning underpins good communication and good stakeholder engagement. It helps to make sure that people know the role and what's needed from them at any given time, making it easier to help, <coughs> making it easier to help as and when it's needed, which brings us to stakeholder engagement. Iraqi cut matrix helps you to define who will be involved in the project. Iraqi stands for responsible, accountable, consulted and informed. And if you take time to complete it during the planning stage, it can be used to drive communication throughout the project. Bear in mind, though, that a stakeholder's needs and interests can change throughout the life of the project, so it's important to review your recce metrics regularly. Once you know who all your stakeholders are, it's very important to understand them. An executive stakeholder might see project, su project success as a project delivered on time and on budget, but an end user might care more about the workflow that they will be using or whether they have had enough training. Harmonization is bringing about multiple sites and systems together in a single way of working. It's a critical success factor for a LIMS deployment. Uh, and whether the network um, has been harmonised onto a single way of working before the project starts, or at least whether harmonisation business change activity is well underway and sufficiently advanced to ensure that the system design is not delayed by decisions on ways of working. This is one of the uh, major challenges that we come across um, when you have various multiple uh, networks coming together to form big one, one big one. Um, you know, harmonization can bring up a lot of challenges. It's best to secure alignment ahead of your limbs implementation if possible to reduce the risk of potentially costly delays and to describe it as a target operating model. Defining the target operating model is clinically is a clinically acti activity that will need to be led by the pathology service management and domain subject matter experts. It requires early engagement and a regular discussion, with discussions being made and captured uh, effectively. So make sure there's strong direction from the project governance structure so that difficult decisions can be readily escalated and resolved quickly. It's also important to look beyond current ways of doing things. Don't think, how do I recreate what we have now? Think more like what would be the most efficient way of using the limbs to solve a clinical workflow challenge. 
Some examples of harmonization considerations of blood bank that um, I have come across um, during my time at Clinicis. Uh, things like what grouping procedure is used in new patients with no history? Can this be aligned across all sites, etc.? For example, some places might do a full group on all samples all the time. Some places might do a full group and check group on their first time and then move to a check group and screen um, uh, for subsequent samples. Um, analyzer platform is being used. Um, is it the same procedures being used across the board or are there different um, analyzer test names being used or different analyzer grouping cards being used? Um, is the client hard process the same? So does everybody do an asset elution initially, then account, depending on the number of cells seen, or do you go straight to flow and miss the FMH count completely? Is the same volume of anti-D used for sensitizing events and births, or is 1500 used for antenatals and then 500 for bleeds? Is there a plan to standardize your cross-match labels across the site and any other stationery? Um, because that can take, that can have quite a lot, a big lead time if you're going to start ha harmonizing um, cross match labels because you need to design the label, you need to get proof back from printers, etc. And um, sample validity um, is everyone using the same sample validity cutoffs or does anybody free samples extend to 90 days, etc. These are just some of the things that we've come across um, during our various deployments and it's sort of worth thinking about whenever you're starting to join. Uh, a network. Another critical determinant for success of any project is the ability of an organization to accurately recognize and address the resourcing needed to complete it within an agreed time scale. In a LIMS contract, the deployment time scale is fixed and the scope of work is fixed, so the business case needs to allocate resources to meet these constraints. It's a high level of engagement with good people sustained throughout the project and particularly during the design and user acceptance testing that will result in a well-built and clinically safe system and a smooth go live that will run to project timeline. Customer effort requirement, it will vary at each stage of the project, but it tends to peak during the design phase. So when we're having our meeting with, the, with customers and designing the system, and again, during um, the testing phase or the user acceptance testing, when a given department may need to have one to two whole time equivalents working on the project full time for a number of months. So if backfill is going to be required, it's important to get this backfill in place because you're going to lose a couple of members of staff from the bench. ICT networking, infrastructure, architects, integration engineers will also be needed, particularly in the early phases. It may be painful to lose some of your best people to a LIMS implementation project for a while, but as uh, we will tell you, that it's more painful to have an overrunning project that draws resource for way longer than it actually is needed. Also, another thing, don't forget about your third party suppliers, um, analyzer diagnostic equipment suppliers, electronic patient records, clinical system vendors, any legacy LIMS providers. They all need to be engaged at the right time to provide testing for instrumentation integra integration and also the provision of data migration, for, especially for uh, blood transfusion. Testing phase, don't underestimate the testing phase. It's another key message and one that we always communicate at um, a project kickoff. A meticulous testing strategy and a testing <coughs> plan are required, not just to ensure quality, but also to preserve project budget and resource levels and to keep those project timelines on track. Designing the test script should start during the low level design phase or the build phase, whenever you can consider whether you will attempt to cover every single workflow and combinations or whether you'll stick to common workflows without disregarding fragmented or less frequent workflows. Uh, the scope of testing uh, is key and should not change once the project and testing has begun. The end scope and out of scope items should be clearly defined and the test activities set out in a test plan. The time it will take to complete the test plan activities should be clearly communicated to everyone involved before testing commences. That way, any delay can be communicated within the structure of the project governance model. 
I talked about resourcing above, but testing is so important that an experienced test manager should be assigned to lead the test teams and to manage the whole testing phase and process. This is another area in which it is best to have a dedicated resource rather than someone taking this on as an assumed role in the project. Plan for after the go live event. To ensure a smooth transition from the go live event to business as usual, it's important to plan for what your pathology network standards business operating model will look like. This will mean reviewing what's currently in place as individual trust SOPs are likely to be different to the SOPs required for working within a pathology uh, system. One thing to think about is whether a new centralised service desk will need to be introduced or whether trusts coming together in the network will continue to triage calls locally. Many networks are using a mixed model, but if that's where you end up, the model should be mapped out from a very early stage. That way, the only authorised users will log incidents with the help desk and they've been triaged with the other end yeah. and have been triaged with the end users. A LIMS deployment project is no different uh, than any other major project. To succeed, you need leadership, you need stakeholder communication, structure and resources. You also need to make sure that you're continually making decisions and looking ahead to the next stage to maintain momentum. Our model is all about the building, building momentum and making sure that the right people are in the right <coughs> structure to do the right things at the right time. This we find generates confidence. It means that energy comes, the energy that comes from a limbs procurement is captured and channeled into the project and can dem demonstrate the progress that is being made and that everything is on track and that go live is going to happen. Many networks are planning limbs deployments over the next few years, so you're very likely to find yourself involved in a go live project at some point. My final piece of advice, if you get the chance, get involved and enjoy it. It's a rare opportunity to make a contribution to the development of a network and to creating a better service for your colleagues, clinicians and patients. A LIMS deployment is a huge amount of work. It's challenging and it's exhausting, but it's also hugely rewarding, particularly on the go live day when everything clicks into place. Thanks for listening and um, if anybody's got any questions, uh, feel free to pop them in the chat.